Yo, what's good? This is Cadence Weapon, and you are tuned in to the Cabbages Podcast. Hi, Gary. Hi, Jeff. Gary. Yes, Jeff. I think it was around the time that a bunch of soldiers were sitting around in a circle, maybe a semicircle, and they were discussing the smell of a days old severed head. Then I said to myself, this isn't the movie that I thought it was going to be. <laughs> this, this isn't the film that my, my brain thought was just like a fun gangster movie with a heist in it. It wasn't that film. This film was a bummer. I thought we were about to embark on a journey that we've seen on film a lot in this in this decade in the nineties. I thought we Damn, were getting... I feel bad because it's just not that film at all. I thought we were going back to Boys in the Hood. I thought we were going to Juice. I thought we were going to New Jack City or with the same directors, the Hughes. You feel like this thing is frequently fronted with those. I thought those we were going I thought we were ready for Menace to Society again. Set I think that's it what off. this was. Yeah. All of these films. I, I think that it must have just been marketed in such a way that we thought it was something that it wasn't. Because what this is, what this film ultimately is, is not a heist film. It is a tragedy. It's just a it's just a tragedy. It's just a tragedy, an American tragedy. And and sometimes Chris Tucker says some funny shit. He does. He gets big guffaw laughs out of me in this film because it's so serious all the time. And he is not. And it's, whew, this is a brutal one, man. Yeah, I think we're, we're going to have gonna... to grapple with some feelings. Yeah. Well, let's bring our guest on. We've got Cadence Weapon this week. I can't even tell you how excited I am to have him on for this. This is amazing. I hope that Caden Swep isn't is excited to be here. He might <laughs> be mad at we, us. He might he be, might be mad at us. I, we haven't had anybody mad at us in a while. I mean, I, we were out the other night, uh, you might recall, and uh, we ran into Premrock uh, in Brooklyn. Mm. And Premrock is still smarting over uh, us giving him bong water as his episode yeah, a couple yeah. years back. He's, so. he's, we got, how do we, yeah. But I feel like maybe if he had done Dead Presidents, he would be probably just as bad as us. This isn't even a we back situation. It feels no. awful. It feels yeah. awful what we've done. Look, we, <laughs> let's let's just bring our guest on, and we'll we'll revisit from here about what the hell. We're doing. Okay, I am so excited to introduce our guest for today's show. Joining us now is Cadence Weapon. He's a Hamilton, Ontario-based artist, writer, and activist. has a catalog of music some two decades deep, and it includes the Polaris Prize-winning Parallel World. His latest album is the techno-futurist warning shot, Roller Coaster, and features production by some of my favorite people, Lorraine James, Machine Drum, and Tate X, among others. And you can hear the recently released Deluxe Edition on Bandcamp or wherever music is streamed or sold. And his 2022 memoir, Bedroom Rapper, was a 2022 Globe and Mail Best Book of the Year. All of these things impressed the hell out of my Canadian wife. I'm thrilled to have you on the show. Hello and welcome. Hey, what's good? Thanks for the great intro. Yeah, you know, it's it's hard to, to, to intro someone like you who has such a history. We talk to artists with like catalogs of all sorts. Some people are just kind of on their first or second project. Somebody like you, I mean, you've been doing this for, you know, I think your first project was 20, 2005. You're doing mixtapes and albums, it's like, it's just so long. So it's like, where do you focus on Heidi with the highlights? But I mean, the good thing is that we don't have to spend too much time on that because this is a podcast about movies. And mm-hmm. we've, uh, we asked uh, you to come on and we gave you a short list of films to pick from. And you came back with Dead Presidents. Yes. Had you seen this film before? Um, not in its entirety. Um, I think when it originally came out, I I I look have images of the like the climax of the movie. Like I definitely I definitely seen it before. 
Um, but at the time I would have been nine years old. So it's not like I, it was something I was going to be allowed to go to the theater and watch. But in my mind's eye, I can I can picture the VHS in in my home. Um, one of the early CDs I can remember seeing in our house is the soundtrack for this movie. Amazing soundtrack. With, uh, unbelievable soundtrack. So I was like, let me actually watch this movie. So I had only known this film kind of by reputation. And uh, Jeff, you had actually seen this before, yeah? I thought I had. <laughs> and then <laughs> I was dropped into a totally different situation. Mm. Uh, I don't know what I thought this movie was. Perhaps <laughs> it was the way it was sold at the time. Uh, but I was like, Good old fashioned gangster shit. Let's get into it. This is gonna be fun, and it it, it was a different kind of fun. <laughs> it was yeah, it was a little I, different than I remember thinking about this. Because I was gonna ask you guys, I had the exact same feeling. Like I had an idea. I was like, okay, so it's like they they rob stuff, you know, and it's like yeah. a, like a heist movie, and there's like gangster vibes. But, it's um, but not I at don't. All. I didn't. <laughs> I had no recollection whatsoever that there was like a Vietnam subplot. I was a teenager when this film came out, mm -hmm. and this was marketed to me as a heist movie. And so I think about there. Were, I could have been conflating in my mind with like other films of the period. You know, things like Set It Off mm -hmm. and a number of other films that existed. That right, but like this was presented the way. This Maybe was I thought it was. was set, like, I know I've seen Set It Off. Maybe I thought it was Set It Off. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So I thought I'm watching. A, I thought I'm about to watch a heist movie, and I've been like, I, you know what? I haven't seen a good heist movie in a long time. I am ready. To, we get in a two hour film. <laughs> we get a grand total of eleven minutes of heist, with maybe three additional minutes of planning the heist. Which for anybody out there who's watched like The Italian Job or any other kind of classic heist movies, this ain't it. <laughs> this is not what you came in for. If you thought that was it, Can instead. I just say yeah there's um the fact that they they show the planning of the heist for only three minutes i would say that's actually realistic because this is the worst plan <laughs> it, they pull it off Dude, so poorly did, so poorly. can i just i, I i'm i'm not gonna Please. like jump in like i don't and i did enjoy the film on a few mm -hmm. on many many levels but like what happened to this dude from the time he walked out of vietnam a certified badass to walk back to America and just be like, everyone steps on this dude's ass. Everyone steps on him. Mm -hmm. And and no matter how much he's like, guys, you know what I went through? They're like, it doesn't, nothing, none of it matters. Now that <laughs> no part I don't mind. No one cares. That part I don't mind because I feel like that was supposed to be conveyed. But also like he gets his ass whipped by a guy who looks like, but isn't a pimp. <laughs> And I'm like, well, did, did, Cuddy I might think be a maybe, but we'll get there. We'll he get might there. be, he might be, well, but we're, like, we're to believe, we're told he is not a pimp. And they never revisited that either. I was like, no. come on, this is, you're, this is very unsatisfying. Like, yeah. dude, you, you lived through and did the, like, I've seen a lot of Vietnam films. I've seen a lot of war films. This was some of the wildest war shit that's ever been made. And you yeah. came back and just let this dude. This fake pimp whip your ass. What's going on? What can we do to get your confidence back, Big Cat? You got to move with some confidence, Big Cat. And, you know, another thing I was thinking about movies uh, from the 90s, um, which I love. I loved watching this because this is the kind of thing they, they don't put on streaming. This kind of movie, it really is uh, the definition of mid. Like, it's so mid, you know? Like, it's not a great film. It's not crappy. It's not like straight to Netflix. It's right in the middle. It's the kind of thing that if you're if you're at a hotel and it was on TV, you'd watch the end of it. Which is the worst part of this movie. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. At yeah. the it's end like, of the day, like you watch the worst heist ever on screen, possibly the most bungled heist that they've been you you, because the, of how because of how much it builds up to this point in your mind, thinking you're watching a heist movie. You see the cover art and you go, This is a heist movie. You see that you see the trailer, you're like I'm watching a heist movie. And You're then not. you spend an hour and 40 minutes not heisting. Instead, you nope. see the horrors of war, the <laughs> brutal realities of you returning know, white, from war. Of returning from war, plus the combination of redlining and white flight that plagued the Bronx and other parts of New York. 
And then there's a heist and you're like, finally, these guys are going to get something. And instead it's just like, no, they just get like, yeah, spoiler shot, alert. If you want to watch cars. the film, uh, there, there, this, this is a sad film. We are not yeah. equipped to deal with this sad film. And it's, <laughs> You know that scene in Goodfellas where like the Derek and the Dominoes, Eric Clapton, like mm -hmm. piano part, everyone's dying. Mm -hmm. That's like so long. And you would have to recycle that song like five times to get just the parts where they're getting caught and arrested and killed. Oh, that's crazy. <laughs> like everyone um, is dying. It, like, oh, you know, it, I'm there's, confused there's by no this. planning. It, what like, are you confused by? No, specifically? Because confused there's by so much. It, yes. Um, because it's like you know who's making this the Hughes brothers, right? And mm -hmm. you know, yeah, they did Menace to Society, and this was their next movie. Yeah, right. So I'm thinking, I'm like, did they not like finish writing this movie or something? Yeah. And they just urgently had to put it out or something. It's like yes. I remember it wasn't it supposed to be like badass like action movie and with the face paint. I remember that back in the day, it was like that was big on Halloween. So many people did that costume, right? And and I'm thinking, it was like, did you guys see this movie? Because they it didn't. was like not, it was barely in the movie. It was like 10 minutes of the movie with the face paint. But you brought up the point about writing. And I wanted to kind of point out, like, this is the Hughes Brothers' second film. Now, they made Menace to Society. They were 20 years old. I think they were 21 when it actually came out. But they were 20-year-olds mm -hmm. making this first movie. And they had help, but like they, and they divided up their duties. So what, they'd be the, like 22, 23 making this? They were like 22, 23 years old making this movie. Wow with a bigger budget than they've ever had. And the, they had basically, they came up with a story idea and then the credited screenwriter on this is a, uh, is a playwright from the Bronx. Uh, given the fact that, that the Hughes brothers are from LA, you sort of, if you're going to tell a story about the Bronx in that period, that you need somebody who understands that. So Michael Henry Brown, uh, born and raised in the Bronx, basically adapted sections of a book about an oral history that came out about uh, people returning from Vietnam, specifically black men returning from Vietnam, and use that sort of as fodder for creating this story. So based on a true story, but like they don't stick the landing. They get to a certain point, and we're, even after the heist scene itself, which I feel like we will constantly come back to in this conversation, <laughs> it's like you had a playwright who knew what he was doing, who knew how to do a three act structure, but something about three definitive way, acts for sure. Yes, but there's something about the way this lands just goes. Actually, no, we're not there, and that's what the critics at the time thought too. Everybody mm -hmm. was just like, the worst part of this film is is the third act. It falls apart in that one, mm -hmm. and like like so many things, there's a lot of scenes that I like in this film. There's mm -hmm. a lot of moments and interactions that I enjoy in this film, but as a whole, it is you understand why it was, as you said, mid. Yeah, no, even even some of the film craft, I have to say, is not like uh, uh, I was surprised for the time that it came out that it was acceptable. Some of the, like, looking at the guts, you know, and it's like this is like Halloween costume level, you know, uh, special effects we're looking at. It's pretty. It's not great. You know, like the blood. Anytime there was blood, I was like, you guys can't be serious with this. You guys are making a, a motion picture. A very serious motion picture. Yes, a I super think. serious right. movie. Crazy spirit series. But then it's like, oh, anytime someone gets punched, it's like a Batman TV show. It's like, kapow. Oh. Kablamo. Like, 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 what's going on here? Because you've watched something that is so harrowing and the story is so is is so sad in so many ways that when these things happen it takes you out of that moment and you go oh what the fuck what the hell was that what was that right there there's the, no reason the fight scenes the the one in the the pool hall where he gets revenge for years of being tormented that were sort of baked into one or two scenes in the movie it leads us to believe that this dude is like a little bit crazy now you know, he's seen some shit, he's going through it, and he will destroy anyone in his path that gets in the way of his happiness. The next fight, he gets the shit kicked out of him and puts <laughs> no fight up whatsoever. None. I, can't, I hate to keep harping on it, but it, it really threw me that, like, this dude, a trained, trained killer with all kinds of bodies stacked, is like, 
Ow. Ow, he hit me. Like, he's not ready for <laughs> someone to punch him. No, he was like, not he's ready like, at all. This is not really very believable. Like, a but like 20 minutes before, he just waxes the floor with this guy's face, with another who's, guy's face. Who, by the way, was Terrence Howard. Terrence Howard, yes. yeah. Very early role by him. He got in a real good main. I, yeah. And he was like, leave me alone, main. <laughs> I, couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't help but laugh because the internet has trained me to like, Watch, watch for the main. Watch for that moment. Watch That's that when moment. shit's about to go down. Is when he's his yeah. main. <laughs> I was wondering, was do you think that might be like the first televised or filmed main? That might be the first main. I think it might this, be, you were talking about horses, because he doesn't do that in um he doesn't do that in Sunset Park. No, no, no. She doesn't do it in that because we did that on a previous episode. It's like we. I always am thrilled to see him show up on my screen, especially these younger versions of him before anything mm -hmm. else. But the truth is, like, yeah, like in before war, Anthony's able to combat that and say, "All right, well, I, 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 I can't actually compete against a guy with a knife." But now, after all of this, it's like, yeah, of course, you should be able to kick the crap out of him, yeah. you know. But then Cuddy, a grown older man. Played played to <laughs> perfection by Clifton Powell. Maybe my favorite in terms of developed character in the entire film. Hmm. The first time we see him on screen, we only hmm. see Clifton Powell as Cuddy the first time. He's only times? in two scenes. Yeah. He's only in two scenes. And yeah. the first scene he's in, it's a minute. One minute. And it is the scene I think that has been served to me on Instagram more than any other. And that is when they were in the car and it is... I want to make sure I got all the characters right. So Juanita and Anthony, so so uh, Rose Jackson and Lorenz Tate are sitting in the car and Cuddy pulls up. It lasts one minute and it's just the longest minute you'll ever see of just two men staring at each other. And so Everything, I, I'm waiting for this. Long, it waiting. was a wrestling stare down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was a WWE yeah. stare down. Isn't he uh, eating a lollipop? As oh, yes, he is. He's got a lollipop. Listen, He's got his hat on. Everything about him in this thing, the car, the fit, the the casual way of doing things, the laughing things off, the, the sucker in his mouth. He's a pimp. And the next thing the woman says, like, he's not a pimp. <laughs> but, like, why wasn't he a pimp? Like, what, I don't what know. Was what, what else was he going on with that? I like, don't he was a pimp. I don't believe. I think she lied. I think she's she not lying. telling the truth. I don't think yeah. she, because I think there were a few things about their relationship that she was not honest with Lorenz Tate about. I wanted more of her and them. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. I felt like that was the most underrepresented part of this whole story is that. Yeah. There's no like, um, you know, uh, stakes with their relationship at all. Like, it's kind of like, okay, he hooked up with her before going to war and, and it's like, does he seemingly, it, you can't tell the tone like it's like, does he really like her, or does he regret it, or like, what's the, you know, can we get a little more information here? And like anything that gives her weight in this story, because it goes from childhood crush to, oops, I'm back in town. Can I have my daughter, or can I like see my <laughs> daughter after I've been in town for like two or three days? Now I'd like to meet my family. Uh, <laughs> To like it's the time before cell phones. This is the time before yeah, phones. Mm -hmm. Kind of smash cut. Like, what's up with like you you need to get a job? <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Like, that's that's the growth of this human being throughout the thing. Is it and then the last thing, the last little bit we get is yeah, I'm having sex with the person that obviously I've been having sex with the whole time. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. he has enough money to actually feed the child that I reared. Because he's a pimp. Gone. And the yeah, kid may not pimp. be yours, too. Well, that's the other side By of this way. that's interesting. Right. Because, like, we don't know the timing of their relationship. We don't know how that works. We just mm -hmm. see the scene. And But I will say that I do want to believe that the baby is Lorenz Tate's baby. Only because uh, I have rarely, in my years of watching movies, seen a more accurate depiction on screen of two virgins having sex for the first time <laughs> incredible in history yeah. in incredible. movie history it's just that's not it especially why she says like, she says it that's not that's it. not it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. she has to adjust it i said like, like how many young men out there on their first go 
Yeah. Got a A plus rating. Try, yeah. try again. Yeah. That ain't it. That ain't um, it. You know, I was thinking about the sex in this movie and how there's just very little of it. Mm -hmm. Sure. If you yeah. think about if this movie was made today, which it would not be made today for various no, reasons. No, for a lot of reasons. Um, but um, if it were made today, you know, there would the sex would have been maybe more like salacious and that, that would have been a bigger part of it. But the way it, you barely see that. But the domestic violence is loud and proud in this movie. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, I was just like, it's weird that they Start went so finish. hard on that, on the the, the strangling. Um, but then, like, you know, they're like, oh, we don't want to really show anything. They went hard on violence throughout. I mean, they don't just, like, kill Michael Imperioli. Okay, we're going to Vietnam, are we? <laughs> they... Crystal they, Falk. like, expose every organ he has to us and shove one organ in his mouth. Was that necessary? No, no. It's haunting it was me. I'm haunting me. Wildly unnecessary. This. Who did wildly that? Wildly unnecessary. <laughs> was that you Vietnam? Know, read, it was did, the Viet Cong. It was the Viet Cong. Do, is that, was, was there any veracity to, to that? We have to look it up, but I will say this. <laughs> I read an interview with I don't want to look it up. I'm not looking to be there, but <laughs> I was really hoping you'd do it, Gary. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> uh, I I read an interview with um, the guy that they based this on, the guy whose life rights they bought. Mm, yeah. And they were like, you know, how close does this come? And he was like, they're fucking way out there. Mm. They are far out with this story. First of all, no shots were fired at the robbery. We rolled up to a dude and said, we know you have a bunch of old money. We're going to redistribute it to our community. Tell them that like four black dudes robbed you, but you couldn't tell them apart. So you don't know how to describe them. Mm. Have a good day. Mm. And that's all that happened. Nice. Which I think is more interesting than like a horrible shootout that kills a leftist and a cop and a, and a, a, a subsequent Police investigation we don't see. <laughs> also, just like also Latino, showing up places. Also, a Latino pyromaniac. Let's have some yeah. representation on screen, <laughs> right. please. Yeah. Hey, let's, let's represent yeah, my, it, my fellow Latino pyromaniacs out mm -hmm. there. We need we need to be represented. We oh you're I didn't know you were a pyromaniac. Oh cool. yeah 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 just oh, just yeah. off screen I got my I've got my you nice learn something new going. about your friends when you just listen. You know, it's I'm like Gary, listen, exactly. your culture isn't a costume. You know, it's exactly this thank is, you. It's real. That's real. Thank you for seeing me. <laughs> the lack of sex and the plethora of violence in this is i think that's so just violent the, i just think that's what the hughes brothers were interested in at the time mm -hmm. and it became in their career a point of contention over time they mm. diverged from each other in subsequent movies to the point where they stopped working with each other after the book of Eli. But mm -hmm. I think it was uh, 2002 uh, from hell. They did the adaptation of the Alan Moore uh, story and they apparently on set fought over how much should be shown versus what should be held back. Mm -hmm. And so I think at this early stage in their career, um, you know, relatively speaking, they were, you know, 1995, they had a, a sense of what they wanted to do. And it wasn't about showing sexy stuff. I think also, and I don't want to get too deep into this part of it, but the nineties, you were more likely to end up threatened with an NC 17 rating mm -hmm. over something mm -hmm. sexual than over something violent. Real. You could cut back, mm -hmm. you cut back. This up. There's, there's there are podcasts that have covered this really well. You must remember this as a great podcast that did a whole season about like the sexy stuff in the nineties, basically starting from like basic instinct all the way through, you know, uh, you know, stuff like boxing Helena and, and things of that mm -hmm. sort. And it really, it really is a thing where I think that as filmmakers, they had a lot more leeway to be able to show that. However, it does mean that they, they cranked that knob a little too high. The Michael Imperioli stuff obviously is, you know, nobody wants to see a, a, a man's junk cut off and put into his mouth. No oh one oh my that. God. The, uh, the book became, maybe uh, in a horror wood, wood movie, mind, his, his, the, the decapitation. Oh, Cleon, it's disgusting. Cleon holding the head. And then we see the head. And then we, we hear from everybody around him that they've been smelling the head that he's taken off of he, this. He dead vehicle, head, which soldier. by the way, like, Another dude totem. that came to America 
And then was like, I don't know how to use a gun. I don't know how anything works. I don't know who I am. I don't know where I am. I just go to church every day. He became, no, he didn't just and go to like, church. He became a hired. preacher. He became <laughs> You're a hired. preacher. And he was like, a preacher before too. It's like, like oh, okay, let me just, just calling me crazy here. Um, Please. If you were at church and, you know, oh, they're, I hear they've got a new preacher. It's like, yeah, I mean, I think he's been through some stuff. Um, and then he comes up there and he's like, yeah, I killed before. I think I'd have a, a bit of a problem with that. I, don't, I, I think my preacher is a murderer. Yeah. What? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I recognize that, like, obviously, a lot of people from that generation had to reintegrate into society and into their communities in some way or another. And some people handled the adjusted better or worse. But the way that they they portray this team of people, most of whom get gunned down or otherwise horribly you know, horribly mutilated and, and mercy killed, as in the case of Michael Pirioli, mercy killed with the morphine. I, I think that we have to account for some of this in here, but it just, it feels like such a dramatic shift when we see Bokeem Woodbine again after seeing him in the jungle complaining about having to bury a severed head that has been sitting in his rucksack for, you know, for two weeks. It's like, when did he become like rehinged? Right. Yeah. He was like how, the the scariest, most like uh, you know, uh, Gomer Pyle guy. And if you yeah, if you become rehinged, do you then completely forget every touch of training you've ever had? He couldn't stand in the street and identify a cop. These people yeah. were yeah. like crawling through jungles and murder, like doing the damn thing as soldiers. Like, and and they get back and they're like, I don't what. Is this what is this thing? Is My this a gun? Was, what is this? He was beyond useless in the heist. <laughs> Just like he's, horrible. And he I'm told them, the and bus. they were like, "Don't worry about it. He's my guy. This is the guy." <laughs> you know, but but the only person who really seems to have had it together during that is maybe second only to Cuddy, my favorite character in the film, which is uh, Chris Tucker's, mm. Mm. and. Just he knew how to handle that situation. You have to kill the cop. Mm. Exactly. You are right. in this situation. It's time. You have no choice. He and he has killed before. He has killed in situations for so long. He's the only one who seems to do what he was trained to do. It's wild how many other people are in this film and they did nothing. Like the woman that like he recruited by coming in and being like, radicalism seems pretty good. You want to rob a an armored car? You mean his baby mother's kid sister? sister. Yeah, who yeah, became, yeah, who became radicalized and yeah. became a revolutionary? Who kissed him? Yes, yeah. for, for yes. reasons unknown. Because they were at <laughs> we're a bar. Not entirely sure. They were at yeah. a bar. I guess that's what you okay. do, right? Every after- time I walk into a bar, beautiful women just kiss me <laughs> on the mouth. Nothing yeah. I can do about it. Because you're, and, a then I, and then you invite them uh, to join uh, you on listen, a heist. I have a great idea for you, a radical. <laughs> What I think you should do is rob an armor, armored car for old money. Just really old money that probably it, has been counted out. Who knows? You won't, you won't believe this. You won't believe what they're doing with this old money. <laughs> you want to find out? Get rid of it. <laughs> but, it's also, of it. but it's also just like the, the, the stupid idea that like that's in there that kind of just has people don't understand how money works. Mm-hmm. And they don't understand circulation because it's it's not we're not taught how this stuff is supposed to be. And it's also a ridiculous, weird system that is not based in reality, like so much in economics that it's like, yeah, people are thinking like, almost like we made it up. We're all having trouble making ends meet. And these people are throwing away millions of dollars. Well, we should just, let's have the millions of dollars. It's like, there's a yes, but (laughs) that never gets addressed. Like, you know, if they hadn't burned all the money, in the explosion in the back of an armored car, maybe, maybe they would have had some trouble with that money for in reasons. some heist movies. You get a um like a cool song while they're mm. like assembling a team. They're like, I'm gonna need some crack, this crack team. I'm gonna go get Keith David and Chris, you know, like and it we yeah. got like the actual discussions between all these people for way longer than we needed. For them to be like, okay, let's hatch a plan. Smash cut. The plan is 
ready. (laughs) They weren't done hiring the team before they made, like the plan was ready before the team. And I'm like, well, I I have a few issues with, with your like order of operations here. I'm not entirely sure I would like make a plan and then be like, okay, now there is no random people around me. But while there is no kind of like, montage with one of the many great songs from this soundtrack on it the music is used in, in in ways that are just like like they're they're taking them way too literally and it goes oh, back yeah. to a couple of scenes we said before so the second time that terrence howard is at the pool hall so now you know now war is over and now they're ready to go through the second time that happens lorenz tate and him this time he wins it and he's gonna he's gonna collect and he's gonna fuck him up if he has to fuck him up and he fucks him up. He's gonna uh, get revenge. And what's playing right behind him? James Brown's payback. You and you even hear him say, and you even hear I'm James mad. Brown say, Revenge, I'm mad. He's it happens right there. And like, okay, guys, we get it. We know what's happening here. And right. then the other instance of that that I noted um is it's when uh we first meet. Clifton Powell's Cuddy. Mm. And again, my, one of, that one minute scene, smiling faces sometimes. <laughs> right underneath that like, whole okay. thing. Assuming yeah, that it's it. playing from his car. Assumes that it's playing from his car. Um, which, you know, look, we've we've done paid in full on this on this show before. Mm-hmm. We know mm-hmm. how you can take a soundtrack of a time and apply it to a film, a story yeah. like this, an uptown story. And a neighbor's room, and a scene like that, and be like, okay, wow, this is really well done. This was but just like slap. This it was on like mm-hmm. so on the nose so that it's nose. almost like the music was the dialogue. Like the music might have been better than the dialogue. I would say it, I mean, it, it was kind of what they wanted to say to each other. <laughs> I would say the music is really the enduring thing about this movie. Like a, a thing that I, I was thinking when I was watching, and every song that came up, it was so obvious to me. Just thinking about the timeline. It's like so many rap producers were just like, yeah, we're going to sample that. And soon. And it's like you can almost see the timeline of it all. Like the idea of all that just 70s centric soul and funk records. Like you have everything from like Sly and the Family Stone, Isaac Hayes, Spinners, Barry White, Blue Notes, Dramatics, Curtis Mayfield, Aretha Franklin, the OJs. Like it's just like here is just crate digging 101 for for what what was coming. I just had a realization. Um, they spent all the special effects money on the soundtrack. Had to, real. Had clearly, to. they it were throwing sense. They were throwing cups of blood at people. They were just like, "Here's, here you go. That, that's just, there you go. Practical effects." Whoa. They went to party city. Me, <laughs> it's a party. Put yourself. I, I, I'd like to. I want to make sure that we we don't lose the the plot on what exactly happened at the heist. Okay. Mm-hmm. Because there's something I just I just want to point something out real quick. Sure. He decides please. to put together a team and it's an old one legged person. OK, who he has seen have a disadvantage in a fight by only mm-hmm. having the like the one the one leg. Mm-hmm. The guy went for his wrong leg. Uh, an anti-violent radicalist. <laughs> that he uh, just reconnected with a heroin addict. Yeah. A reformed uh, preacher who essentially has forgotten how guns work. And easily the best of this team was the guy that was supposed to blow things up and was really good at it. Yeah. And he was, he fucked up everything. Even with the like horrible things that happened, at least they could have gotten away with the money, but dude blew up all the money. <laughs> Yeah, burned all the money. this goes back just to the initial heist plan it's like you plan. guys didn't, you guys it, it involved blowing up the money what they blew up the money why would you blow up the car with the money in it why would you do it you what would the, the point money. be yeah for the heist if if you're gonna do that if you're gonna rob the car and the car is your thing and you're going to blow something up, just switch to the door. Let them go in and do their thing and drive off and then blow the door up. Mm. Blow the bloody doors doors off. Yeah, exactly. Blow the doors off that motherfucker and take the money. What are you doing worrying about this van? What is the point of the van? Also, they talked about like, oh, when they get out to exchange, we'll, we'll make a move. 
why are you waiting for them to get out and be like ready and armed and on their most alert? <laughs> this plan is bad. That's yeah. what I'm getting at. Well, even like all the plan of where they're going to be is like, yeah, and you're going to be in the dumpster and you're going to pop out of the dumpster. It's like, okay, well, kind of slow response time from being in the trash. So he's got the wrong people in the wrong plan. Yep. And then afterwards he's like in total disbelief that people died. Can't believe and it. He's also in total disbelief that he ends up having to uh, suffer the consequences of his actions. Right. right. That's another fun one. Oh, and you know, the money that they do get, it's it's really damaged. Yeah. Right. I'm, I'm money. wondering what happens if you you know you go to if you're Bukim Woodbine's character, he's like, Hello, I'd like a, a Cadillac, please. And you just give them Here. like charred hundreds, twenty ten thousand so dollars in how burnt long bills. <laughs> How long was it between the the botched robbery and the beginning of arrests? I'm gonna say a week. A week? Because why? Why would you have all of this money laying around and not in a easily packed up place where you could be like, I heard somebody got busted by the cops. We gotta get the fuck out of here. Mm -hmm. They're this like, uh oh, the cops are here. Fill the bags back up with the money. <laughs> Oh my God. These Don't guys, they are not Ocean's Eleven. No, I couldn't help they, but think about um, Heat. Right? Oh now. yeah, it's, sure. It's like the opposite of Heat. Same here, meticulously too. 1995, planned. 1995. Amazing this in, is in, the polar opposite in, of Heat. Inspiring plan. It's cold. Like if you really want to try this, I, I you know I don't recommend it, but you want to watch Heat if you're going to do it. Real? Yeah. Heat is the perfect example of, of a film that is a heist film that mm -hmm. doesn't necessarily let you into everything that's happening and spends a great deal of time building up to the heist with exposition and backstory all while planning a heist. And then this happens and you go from, we're just showing you this person's life and then, hey, I had an idea, let's have a heist. And then that happens in a backfires. And I have to say, I think maybe... Maybe this is to play to just play devil's advocate against ourselves for the moment. This may actually be a more accurate depiction of how a lot of robberies tend to go down. Mm -hmm. People aren't genius planners or thinking of all the angles. They have an idea that's very basic and they have a need that is immediate and they go for the thing. And it's no wonder how many people get well, arrested would, for it. I'd mm -hmm. be more mm -hmm. inclined to believe that if these people were fucking accountants but they were like majority soldiers. Yeah. Yeah. Like they can't be this. This can't be Keystone cops. If you're trained, you know what I mean? like you're trained to like take care of these types of situations. But I will, I want to point out Anthony, there's no reason why he would be smart. So yeah. I don't know why he was in charge of the plan for the heist in the first mm -hmm. place. Like he's, he is no, it's education. obvious that he shouldn't have been. And that, no, listen, Keith David, my favorite character in the whole thing, Keith David's character. Oh, yeah. Uh, Kirby. He, yeah, Kirby's awesome. And mm -hmm. Kirby is the one that disappointed me the most. Mm -hmm. He, like, stared down the barrel of this plan after years of hustling, decades of hustling, and was like, the, the players, the cast, the moves, they're solid, baby. Let's go get this money. Yeah, I, I just I, I was really disappointed in his character just being like, no, 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 no. We have to listen to him. For what? For what reason? If someone keeps coming in and making bad points, I'm no longer going to listen to them. It's just yeah. sort of how I'm built, I guess. I don't know. Well, that's what a real person would do. Um, but in this movie, you yeah. notice uh, before he's like, you know, we, we were running numbers, but we're not doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I'm fresh out of ideas what to do next <laughs> i don't have any more ideas i was just gonna hustle forever i i want to talk about some things i liked in the film though like the mm -hmm, heist sure. really ruins what you know there was some issues of course but like the first the first part of the first act their kid like their childhood phenomenal mm -hmm, mm -hmm, no yeah. no notes whatsoever up to like even past the sex scene and when he's running and then it like transitions slowly into like mm -hmm. gunshots in Vietnam. I remember thinking, oh, 
shit. Yeah. Guys are going to ruin a good thing. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I feel like you should, maybe a, there should be a, like an age limit on people making war movies. <laughs> oh, well, you know, that's actually a good point. Like 22, um, 23, never been to war. Now we're going to show you the heightened passion and wildness of, of being in war. But actually that's a good point. I, I saw this in some of the reviews. It's like, uh, with Minutes to Society, they're speaking to, you know, California. They're speaking to, like, their age range. You know, yeah. and, and, you, know you got to write what you know. And then sure. now they're, like, talking about the past and stuff. They're like talking that. to adults. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. You, clearly, they're kind of out of their depth. You can feel there's, like, a bit of a, a spike leanness to, mm. to a lot of it, mm. too, which mm -hmm. I found that kind of charming. Just to, just mm -hmm. to, they would do uh, The that. first act really feels like it, for sure. Yeah, it reminds me of the beginning of Malcolm X. A bit. Mm -hmm. Sure, absolutely. And, um, like they're they're trying to tell a, an epic there. They're trying. Yeah. To. Yes. Yeah. Yes. They're trying to you know they're they're trying to get get outside of themselves a little bit, and uh, it do doesn't quite work. But I I like you know but I like yeah, there are they, some wonderful parts in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. I was captivated for the very beginning, and even some of the war stuff. Like uh, I was in it for the war. I was like, you're over the top. I get it. You're really trying to hammer home that this was a wild time but like his conversation in the like little the village area with chris tucker mm. i was into that like when they slowed it down mm -hmm. yeah and they weren't like check it out now he's dead you know how war right. works it's wild isn't right. it oh this guy's sticking his in it's in his mouth that's actually really off. what we needed more in this movie more like exposition and, and a really little bit like especially in areas states. where you don't know how it works mm -hmm. but never i think been there but i think there there's something to be said about the emotional resonance of those earlier scenes of just there are three teenage boys and they're talking to each other about teenage boy stuff and what they're going to do when they graduate and what they're going to what kind of lives they're going to have and it's just like okay like that's great so that scene when in vietnam where lorenz tate and chris tucker are conversing over a beer it's like that's a return to that. It's like now these 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 boys have been shaped or are being shaped into the men they are becoming. Mm -hmm. And those guys are talking and they're having realizations and thoughts about these things. And that's great. And you lose that after Vietnam. You do yeah. see the experiences, obviously, the hardships that people experience and you're trying to get a job and not being able to get work and the the kind of societal stuff that works around it and kind of what led people to think, well, I, you know, life of crime maybe is going to be, or this one big score is going to be the thing I need to, to change things. But you lose the sort of interpersonal conversations. Those dissipate after that scene. His I, think, return. I think that's where, I think that's where if we're going to talk about the inexperience, it's where two 23 year olds lose it. After that mm -hmm. point, it's like we don't have the life experience mm -hmm. to tell the next mm -hmm. part of the story. We but there were some performance things that really work, like mm. uh, him coming home from Vietnam, mm -hmm. the first round of seeing people was really excellent. Yeah, I like, like that. He gets made fun of by the same dude, and it's very contentious and annoying, and it's because, you know, uh, oh, God, Skip. Mm -hmm. It's because Skip is, like, lost in, lost in the heroin. And yeah. him snapping back into form and being like, no shit, you're back. Like that part was great. Their walk and like his, there were problems with uh, our female lead per se, mm -hmm. but like certainly their first conversations were awkward and weird and cool. I thought yeah. him eating, eating food and not being able to look anybody in the eye. Mm -hmm. at dinner mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the mom not being able like to converse with him because he just isn't going to talk about what he saw that shit was cool there was a lot yeah. of really cool stuff and then you'd get a scene a lot of the barroom scenes felt unnecessary terrence howard was wildly i mean i love that dude but he was wildly <laughs> unnecessary would we need a, a foil for this guy to be just killed a lot of people i don't need a toughness meter on this dude i yeah. know he's pretty fucking <laughs> tough 
you know, I, I want to give Chris Tucker props though. I, I feel yeah. like he was I really he was a standout great. in this movie. Yeah. It was kind of his um his pookie moment, you know, like a Chris okay. Chris Rock, mm-hmm. New Jack City. Yeah. That that was like his version of it. And he he was he was really um he was really an interesting character. I think any line that Chris Tucker says in this movie could be repeated by Smokey and Friday. <laughs> there's there's incredibly, a, a strong incredibly. connection to mm-hmm. the Friday movies in this. Mm-hmm. I think there's like four actors. Yeah, well, because they go Powell's on to be in. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, a big Sopranos of... connection too. If you... Huge. Tony Sirico is a cop. Absolutely. Exactly. Polly Walnuts shows mm-hmm. up for that. But there's there's a there's a couple of lines that I I, I pulled out uh, from that Skip says that Chris Tucker says that I thought could easily have been in in, in any any part of the movie Friday. He says this. He says, my great, great, great granddaddy was a pimp and a slave. He would have his hose out in the field picking his cotton for him. He didn't have to do a goddamn thing. <laughs> I a thousand percent could have seen him saying that to Ice Cube. Absolutely. A thousand percent. Mm-hmm. He also says the very colorful line, and I apologize for language, uh, everyone out there. Uh, I was yeah. born by the pussy. I'll die by the pussy. <laughs> it's and just a- like. It's a hilarious it's an hilarious thing because they they continually do this. He falls back on this throughout the film. Mm-hmm. And it adds to his character. Yeah. Like there's a really 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 funny thing. We watch him twice and the second time I watched it <clears throat> there was this funny part where he's walking. It's during their walk when he the main character returns from Vietnam. When Lawrence gets back in. <clears throat> yeah. And he says to someone off screen like, "Hey, tell your sister I'm going to be back later on." Or something to that effect. And you can hear in the background, I go, man, fuck you, Skip. <laughs> it's like the funniest line of the whole thing. <laughs> and it, that's the type of show. I was like, this, you guys know how to make a film. You just didn't know how to make this one. And fair enough. It's hard. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a hard, it's a hard thing to do a period piece with a, a whole act about war. As right, a 23 year old, and then also like juggle family stuff. Barroom brawls. Well, the family X-Mill. stuff is really what I had a problem with, you know, okay. in, that, mm-hmm. in that final act. When he is his, what is his motivation? He's like, okay, he needs money, right? But then it's uh, really not. They didn't give enough of the stakes, really, of like why, like he really cares enough to be doing all this, to be the the heist leader, and do. It really isn't made clear enough why no. we should care why he should care why anybody should really care about what's going on here clearly there's no relationship between him and that child that's anything beyond superficial Mm -hmm. and there's no good relationship between him and the mother Mm -hmm. and so at the end of the day it's like sometimes you see these films the motivation is i gotta be able to provide for my kids and get them what they need my family needs what they it's not there so now it's just like we just need money okay i i get it we want money we want money that that that's fine. Like everybody wants money to some extent for a reason or another. What gets me about, about that, that bit of it is that we don't have anything to root for at that. Mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. So when they fail as spectacular as they do, it's you're disappointed, but you're not devastated. Mm, you know, let me just bring it back to heat because that is a movie that does an amazing, amazing, amazing job of getting you to root for both sides. Yikes. Yes. That's rare. We cut right? giant steaks up. It's steaks insane. and potatoes the stakes, in that movie. The steaks could be sure. higher. It's yeah. insane. The it's stakes. all over life for death for these guys. It's life and death for every character in that movie. And I'm yes. about to blow your minds, guys. Please, I'm ready. Guess what year Heat came out? 1995, right? 1995. Same year. The same, same year as this film. They really just, are opposites. Fuck. It's so... They truly are. But obviously, like, Michael Mann as a director, you know, is he, he'd he been doing this for decades. Yeah, like, very experienced. Just, yeah. This is somebody who, you know, he... And, this, and Heat is his second time making that movie. He, the original mm-hmm. yeah. Heat... Heat is originally... They did a, a, a TV movie mm-hmm. that tells the same story. But then he gets the chance to do this version, and, oh, boy, he did it. But, like, everything about... It, I'm reading Michael Mann... Wrote this, wrote a novelization sequel to Heat called Heat Two. Yes, and I'm reading that right now. I actually. need to. Che- I need to check that. And I it, it takes 
It takes place immediately after the events of the film. Fellas, you guys want to watch Heat? Oh my God! Just yeah, let's just go home and watch Heat. I mean, look, we we've watched Heat for no good reason. We just watch That's Heat. That's true. Period. That's true. I mean, that when you want to talk about a heist scene, that is the perfect heist scene. But also, the aftermath of the heist is mm. incredible. Gary and I, did, Gary and I went to see Heat at the um, the Museum of the Moving Image in Astoria. Yeah, oh yeah, and yeah. their their speakers are like crazy. I swear to you, I walked out of there with PTSD. That <laughs> firefight in the street absolutely floored your boy. I was just like, wow. "All right, everybody, I've seen this movie a billion times, but it hit so hard with the right sound yeah. that like and, and they really screen. are having a like crazy war in the street over some cash." Yeah, it's crazy. Amazing. I wish this film could have had had some sort of resonance like that. And in the end, when of all people, fucking Judge Martin Sheen shows up <laughs> to sentence this man to essentially life in prison and his outrage about it, you're like, well, what did you think they were going to fucking do to you? <laughs> yeah, he throws a chair at him I'm like, dude. Yeah, okay. The chair throwing happens before you get your friends killed. Yeah, that right. should be a step that you have already taken as you've thrown a chair at a judge. This, you know what I mean? Like that rings pretty hollow when all of your friends are dead. Or it, it's, it's very not like um, New Jack City. Um, when he starts, he's like, "I'm bringing you all down with me," and it's, and it's just this like triumphant, like, "Oh shit!" moment. Like it just isn't that. It is. It. It. I feel like it's kind of groping towards. Uh, you know, throwing uh, th- throwing the stuff through the window uh, in um, Do the Right Thing. Mm. Like, I feel like it's supposed to have that intensity, but it's just kind of like... Totally. Why, and that is, is like doing this? one of the great moments in cinema. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And this was far too little too late for him to be like, I'm going to show some emotion. Like, the credits are rolling, my guy. Yeah, bro, we yeah. had two hours for emotion, and you just kept being like, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. Two entire hours. <laughs> No, thank you. I'm I'm good. I don't I need think, to show any emotion. Hey, this guy's like plowing my girl and it's gonna basically steal my kid. I'm going to the bar. I, yeah. But you know, I would I guess I'll do a heist. <laughs> yeah, you know what? I'll yeah, show I them. I don't I'll really get everybody killed. I'll have her sister killed. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of which, her character <laughs> bothered me quite a bit because like they use they use radicalism in this in a really weird way. Mm-hmm. Like it's always lurking in the background, but no one ever embraces it. It's also this until fake, why is it a fake Black Panthers type? Right, movie? right. Could they yeah. not get the rights to? Do you need to get the rights? To Are there Black rights? Panthers? Yeah, I was going to say. I like know. I see people in Black Panther shirts all the time. Like, None why of them, did they do that? Why nobody got paid for that. <laughs> they did like a fake group. I thought again watching it for the first time. I thought he's going to join up with these people, and that's going to be the motivation right. for the heist. And mm-hmm. that's he's going to get involved with that... some other people who are motivated, and their reasons are more than just "I want money." But it's like we need money for the movement. She or was the only like person in there, capitalist or something, right? Or, like yeah. there, were, that would have been to me such a wild, wild. That ride was another if you got thing to that, that stage the, of it. That's another thing that the dude said in the interview where he was like. I went to Vietnam and I came back hyper radicalized Mm -hmm. and the meticulous planning we put into like figuring out where that, you know, where all that money was going was specifically to give to whatever the black Panther party chapter that was near me. I don't know if it was actually the black Panther, but he was like, we were going to redistribute all of that. And they just sort of wrap it up in like, Oh, we gave some Christmas gifts to some kids randomly. Mm-hmm. They don't see they 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 don't they just kind of again, shit on radicalism in this movie. But they also really didn't know that. how to they didn't know how to tell the story they were trying to tell because it yeah. would have been very clear in the Vietnam scenes they they a better filmmaker would have used them differently. The Vietnam scenes where there's the flyer drop. Yeah. That is specifically designed for the enlisted black soldiers telling them this is not your fight. Go home. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like these people are not they're not here to help you. Like go home. It's like that. Sort that's of thing real. That was a real thing. Yes, that happened, that happened. And, that, and that's in, very interesting. That's extremely right. interesting. Yeah. Even um, that is the that's the thread you want to follow. Even um, Chris Tucker's character having the um, Muhammad Ali quote at the beginning yeah. of the movie. It's like mm-hmm. you know, talking, referencing. It's like uh, they never did nothing to me. You know. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's Absolutely. like not revisited, really. So they 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 they, they kind of tease at 
this dip into radicalism, which would have made a lot of sense given his character arc, you know, kind of disseminate, you know, kind of, yeah, yeah. Know, kind of breaking from his, his, his middle class upbringing and then breaking from his sort of, you know, forced together nuclear family situation to then become this violent radical who engages in heists for a higher cause. Instead of just like, no, nah, he's just still stuck at the neighborhood pool hall with the old guy used to run. Yeah, and he like recruits him. the fellas for a job. And recruits mm -hmm. the fellas for the, a job. It, it's just such a like um, deflated ver deflated version of what could have been in that moment. There's a I mean, there's a there's a a war, a family, uh, a heist. There's so many things that he could like radical fucking uh, ideas being thrown at him. At no point does he react to any of it. <laughs> he doesn't react <laughs> to any of it. He gets no. the shit kicked out of him. He's just like, no. Because he's not that deep. He's not that it's deep. It's just there's no depth to this character. It really was hard to watch. But, you know, I've got this a person wild... wade through this life. I've got a wild but... vision, guys. What is it? Oh, yeah. I got a wild vision. What Are if we it, what if Dead this Breath? what if this movie doesn't even matter mm -hmm. at all? Mm -hmm. What if the content of the film doesn't matter, but all that anyone remembers is this picture behind me? That's pretty much right. And you can think of other media like this where the actual film fades in obscurity and you just remember the image or like one scene or like one character survives from it in, in the culture. And this is it. People will always just remember this movie. Like if I were to talk to my sister, it's like, do you remember dead presidents? She'd be like, yeah, like with the paint. And like, I was, I was like looking for an image. But also I, I like yeah. people getting vivid images of the Im Vietnam war. <laughs> it's also got a bunch of other stuff. No one no, cares. No, 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 no. No one cares. It's just I think the paint. No. Just it's just face. about a symbol and a, a symbol that represents it that becomes your instantly thing. And I think at the end of the day, the further I get from this movie in my life, because I'm not going back to it, be honest, no. everybody, I'm not going no. back to it. The thing it's I probably so will sad. remember the most, the thing it's I'm going to remember the most film. is exactly that image behind you. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to remember. You know what I'm going to remember? And I'm glad that I remembered it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to remember Keith David the pig speech yeah because he's like why did you get out of the hustle and he's like pigs are greedy <laughs> and i deal with the greediest pigs of them all the nypd yeah and i was like who okay y'all hired the right dude and gave him the right moment and he delivered that shit he turns to the main dude and goes pigs are greedy <laughs> He His like voice is absolutely line. insane as well. He has like the if craziest you want, voice ever. If you he, want something delivered correctly, you get Keith David on the phone. If you have his number, you get him on the phone. Putting aside for the fact that we had a very good conversation with Caden's Weapon, mm. I think we need to address what's going on here okay okay i think a, a little state of the union yeah yeah i think i think we need to kind of state of the state here mm -hmm. the uh the last time we met uh after our, our episode for the crow mm -hmm. you had expressed uh, this desire for us to uh to do more serious movies to kind of move right, away right. from sort no, of this totally. like Bad, Maybe good, I, good, bad movie, bad, good movie sort of thing. I feel you, like I misspoke, maybe. Oh, you misspoke. Yeah, no, like, I didn't know serious meant, like, horribly depressing to you. I don't know. Like, I, I Here's what I want. Here's what we uh -huh, need. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. What we do we need? Silly, but well-made. You know what I mean? We need, like, I don't think that we should sacrifice good because we're going to overcorrect on serious does that make sense yes but i don't know if we're the based on our track record yeah are we the right people to make these determinations yeah no because well i mean i don't know who else would but be, be, i'm just saying because cadence weapon said we should do heat mm. and like that is a movie that is universally considered 
one of the best films of the 1990s. 100%. And, and, and I have it, no it is, it has been discussed at length. That's the thing. By is, I don't want to critics and generally films like that aren't things that we've, we've touched on this show sort of because it seems like the conversations have been had and it is, I'm glad we actually did talk quite a bit about heat in this episode because it is mm-hmm. the like parallel there. It's like, actually like these two movies got the same year. One of them did it really well. Another one did mm-hmm, not. Mm-hmm. Okay. But, so- I, but I don't, I just don't feel like serious to that level is our forte. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I think like pedal to the metal drama not not my strong suit for sure i like you know we had some laughs at some unfortunate things (laughs) but uh i i think where where we want to go we don't want just the axis to be silly Mm -hmm. we also want you know we want a y axis that's like still quality okay like a, a cool director a fun movie but mm-hmm. like the performances, things are good in the movie. The movie's good because it's like a cool movie that was made stylistically or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I, I think there's there's definitely some straight drama. I should have I should have maybe curved the idea of seriousness for like I just want to watch something that like I'm enjoying on multiple levels and not mm-hmm. just good God, how how did you get this thing into a theater into multiple theaters? How did you do it? You know what I mean? So do you have something in mind? Do you have like something that might fit that little nexus you've created in your mind of what might be? Yeah. Okay. I got something in mind. I got All something right. in mind. All right. Maybe we give it a shot. Maybe we don't. I don't know. It's the Cabbages Podcast Network. <laughs>